Okay, Roots of Popular Music, continuing. Uh, so we heard some Bob Marley and, and, and Queen and Peter Frampton, great music from the mid-70s that wasn't disco. But disco music was decidedly the rule as far as the music that was selling the most records, getting the most radio play, getting the most focus, getting the most club play. Disco is widely or became widely regarded as sort of vapid, inconsequential, repetitive music. And that's true in a lot of ways. A lot of disco music was horrible. A lot of it was inane lyrics or very simplistic melodies put above a driving bass and percussion beat that was designed to keep people who were probably high on cocaine on the dance floor for 15 straight minutes. That's what a lot of disco did. As much as alcohol was the drug of choice in the early 60s, marijuana and hallucinogens became the way to go in the late 60s, cocaine picked up in the mid-70s. And as part of the club culture associated with disco music, cocaine was the drug of choice for many. In addition to this fact, you had a geographical reality coming into play. We've heard about New York and Los Angeles as being sort of the, the centers of music in, in different ways at different times, but you always hear about New York and LA. We've also talked about music that came from or was heavily influenced by the sounds and the cultures of New Orleans at different points, Memphis at different points, Chicago, St. Louis, Philadelphia, Nashville. All of those played a role. In disco music, it was New York and LA, but there was another city that disco music helped put on the map musically, and that was Miami. All of a sudden, the clubs in Miami, the sound of Miami, Caribbean influences that were coming through Miami, all of these things really played a role in disco and popularized Miami as a key, um, key center of the, the music business and the music sound. And a lot of great artists came out of the disco movement, but one of the best was a group called um, Casey and the Sunshine Band. Casey and the Sunshine Band were great examples of this Miami sound. Casey was a guy named Harry Casey and Harry Wayne Casey. And he pulled together this Sunshine Band and it was a band of a very uh, disparate group of people, male, female, black, white, you know, green, pink, plaid, whatever. Everybody seemed to be represented in the Sunshine Band. It was a large group of folks, but it was always led by Casey, this white dude who looked like your prototypical kind of next door neighbor, circa 1975. Casey and the Sunshine Band had a lot of huge hits, but one of the biggest was one of their earliest called That's the Way I Like It. Casey and the Sunshine Band with a disco classic. That's the way I like it. Casey and the Sunshine Band from 75. Uh, Donna Summer. Queen of disco, without a doubt. Nobody could touch Donna Summer in terms of popularity throughout the disco movement, especially in terms of individual singers. You had certain bands, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Chic, the Bee Gees, both of whom we'll talk about, who uh, reigned as very popular artists. But Donna Summer... She was right up there. And Donna Summer had done some recording, had tried to launch a recording career, but she hadn't had a lot of success. And she was a musical theater actress as well. And she was touring in a European production of Hair, I believe. It was either Hair or Godspell. I think it was Hair. And she was in Germany. She met a producer named Georgia Moroder, and they started working together. He was very keen on this burgeoning style of music called disco. 
and he loved working with electronics, working with percussion. Donna Summer was a great singer, and by taking her vocals and his sort of uh, wizardry behind the, behind the boards, if you will, they came up with a sound. Now, Donna Summer wrote a song called Love to Love You Baby. It was, I have read, originally intended to be a comedic piece because it was so widely dependent on overt sort of moaning and sexualized sounds. But um, it wasn't taken as a comedic piece. It was taken seriously and it was uh, popularized. And Donna Summer gained a certain notoriety as a result that she would quite frankly play up the sort of sex kitten thing for a lot of her career. But Love to Love You Baby, whether it was a joke, whether it was real, who knows, what it became was a number two hit in 1976, got Donna Summer's career off to a bang. And the version of Love to Love You Baby that I have loaded on Spotify is the club version, which is 16 minutes and 49 seconds long. You'll get the idea if you just listen to a couple minutes of Donna Summer's Love to Love You Baby. Okay, you get the idea. Donna Summer, Love to Love You Baby, huge hit, disco era, 75, 76. Okay. Love Machine by The Miracles, our old friends from Motown, Smokey Robinson and The Miracles. These were The Miracles without Smokey, but uh, they made a disco record and it was a good one. We'll, we'll talk about in a minute how a lot of people made disco records who shouldn't have. The Miracles, they did a good job. Love Machine became a number one hit in early 76. Take a listen. Great tune, great tune. Another Motown icon who uh, created a disco classic, Diana Ross was not a, uh, a disco artist at the time. Um, she had earlier in 1976 released a huge, a hugely popular ballad from the movie Mahogany. But in the summer of 76, she recorded a song called Love Hangover, did a disco version of it, and it caught on in the clubs and it wound up moving over to radio and it gave Diana Ross one of the biggest hits of her career, Love Hangover by Diana Ross. It's a great tune, Diana Ross, Love Hangover. Now, Wild Cherry, another disco classic. This band, uh, the band itself only had a couple of hit records, but they basically had this song and nothing else compared in terms of popularity. Play That Funky Music was a hugely popular song in 1976, and it's held up pretty well. The rumor goes that Wild Cherry was a bar band that was playing in a, in a bar, and they had a group of uh, African-American patrons who were getting rowdy and one of the women at the table stood up and said play that funky music white boy and when the band went on break the lead singer kind of took that um line and wrote a song around it i don't know if it's true i wasn't in the bar but um that's the rumor bottom line play that funky music by wild cherry goes down as one of the great songs in disco history give it a listen Play that funky music, White Boy, Wild Cherry. Great tune from 76. Okay. Disco was so pervasive for a couple of years that it felt like every song on the radio was a disco song. And if you loved disco, then you were happy. But if you didn't like disco, it was hard to find something to listen to that wasn't disco. And one of the things that was going on was 
there were bands and artists who had never done disco music before who crossed over and did a disco record or a disco album because disco was everywhere and they wanted to sell some records. In some cases, it worked out okay, but there were lots of examples of bands who did a disco record and you're just like, why did you do that? In addition to bands and artists, there were also a certain kinds of music that were put to disco. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. There were story songs in disco and uh, novelty records in disco and classical music put to disco. Such an example, Walter Murphy, who had a, an orchestra called the Big Apple Band, Walter Murphy and his Big Apple Band took Ludwig von Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, put a disco beat behind it, called it a fifth of Beethoven, and went all the way to number one in 1976. This is a fifth of Beethoven by Walter Murphy and his Big Apple Band. Walter Murphy and the Big Apple Band, a fifth of Beethoven, a number one disco classic. All right, uh, that's it for this time. And come back because we still have to talk about the movie that would generate the soundtrack that would, quite frankly, bring the disco movement to an end. I'll see you next time around.